I am the what? Oh, The Matrix? That's the greatest movie of all time. Oh, Inception? That's the greatest movie of all time. Okay, so that wasn't the greatest movie of all time, but both of them definitely had major impact in popular culture. Listen, Inception, a movie that deals with diving into different levels of very vivid dreams that are almost indistinguishable from reality, is actually more or less The Matrix, a movie about a computer program that simulates reality for all those human beings that have been plugged into it from birth, but for a different generation. Now I realized this when there were 20 year olds and younger, you know, Gen Z, mentioning on the internet comments situations that people in my generation would have found perfect for saying it's like the Matrix. But instead they weren't saying it's like the Matrix, they were saying, oh, it's like Inception. Now at first I didn't know why they would say this. What do you mean Inception? It's the Matrix. Only for me to think about, wait a minute, the Matrix is a movie I watched in theaters back in 1999. Well, a 25 year old today was just six years old then. They wouldn't grasp the whole trend of this shooting crap that happened because of the Matrix. But hey, I'm not here to hate on them. The fact is back then I'd hate on the Matrix as a Star Trek fan, particularly Star Trek The Next Generation, you know, with Captain Picard, which is maybe in my opinion, the greatest Star Trek ever. All through my high school when people were mind blasted because of the matrix and saying stuff like, hey, it's like the matrix. I was like, hey, you mean it's like the holodeck, Fuck the matrix. The holodeck is a special room that converts energy into matter back and forth, at least to the certain degree to simulate environments and surroundings on a starship introduced in the next generation of the Star Trek universe. But knowledge of the holodeck and how many times that the concept of being in a completely holographically projected environment has been used over and over again, in Star Trek The Next Generation anyway, wasn't the knowledge of the general public. Now The Matrix however was a blockbuster movie that blasted its way into the general public's understanding. With amazing effects, creative aesthetics, and a general creepiness to the whole idea that what we experience around us might just be a simulated reality. Because mechanical overlords have placed us into the machine world. The concepts however take us to a particular philosophic situation. Rene Descartes. Yes, there are a lot of philosophers for sure. But if you're in the Western world and you're gonna start, I really suggest this guy. One, because he's young enough to be able to sort of relate to, you know, he's not some kind of ancient. Two, he purposely made being understandable very important to him, such that he even decided not to write his philosophy in some kind of fancy dancy language of the academic philosophers before him. Instead, he wrote his philosophy in the language of the people, which for him was French, because he's from France. Three, it's easier to grasp, yeah, but more importantly, it pushes you into that particular philosophic position that sets you off on this wicked fun philosophic journey. So what's that situation then? How do you know what you think you know? See, the stereotypical answer was, and pretty much still is, well, I sense it, I see it, I believe it. I use my senses to know things about the world. Well, Descartes says, fuck that. Okay, well, he didn't, he didn't say it like that. But he did present a few arguments, or rather a few hypothetical situations to improve his argument as to why you can't really trust just what you see, hear, and touch to tell you about what's real. Yeah, Descartes be like, hey, you can't trust your eyes, you gotta use your brain. Well, not brain, you know, mind at least. Anyway, these movies actually draw a pretty much direct relation to some of the hypotheticals he presents. Hypotheticals highlighting why you really can't trust what you're seeing. Such as, one, bitch you crazy. Two, you in a dream, bro. Three, you're being possessed. How do you know you're not suffering from some serious mental illness in which your perceptions of reality are so warped that you're actually hallucinating things and even having false memories and believing that actually they were always like this? How do you know you're not really in an incredibly vivid dream? Many people who are having vivid dreams have no clue that they're actually dreaming. Only until after do they wake up do they realize, oh, I was dreaming that whole time. They actually took their dream with the same level of unquestioned surrounding as they do when they wake up. Again, only that once they are awake, they realize there actually was a good reason to question it when they were asleep. But again, they weren't aware of that. Now I'm saying possessed, only theatrically. Really he's wondering, what if God's messing with you? But not really God, because God's supposed to be good, whatever, listen. 
some entity much more powerful than you, maybe not omnipotent, but again, it's not like we could tell, is manipulating all of your senses. Now, the modern version of this is called the brain in the vat argument. The idea being that you could just be a brain in a vat and an evil genius takes the place of this uh, deceptive god or demon. By plugging in different electrodes into your brains, the evil genius can simulate all of your senses around you. By plugging in electrodes to different parts of your brain to stimulate all of your senses, so that everything around you as you experience it is really just your brain being manipulated by this evil genius. This is obviously the matrix. And that dream argument, that you could be experiencing an incredibly vivid dream and not even know that you're actually dreaming? Well, that's obviously Inception. Now, there's obviously a bunch of other movies that correlate pretty well to these hypotheticals as well. The Truman Show matches up with the evil demon or evil genius argument pretty well. Vanilla Sky matches up with the dream argument. The <laughs> Am I only picking old movies? <laughs> Man, I'm old. And there are countless movies about people struggling with reality and their perception as they're going through hallucinations that match up pretty well with the bitch you crazy argument. The thing is, philosophy is often assumed to be just sort of up in the air magical emotional opinion. But there are many different kinds. A kind that tries to figure out what, if any, objective knowledge we do have in a serious fashion, knowledge we could have regardless of any hypothetical situation, is one that I actually study and have a specialized degree in. And Descartes is a big step in that. But movies like The Matrix and Inception made so much easier to explain this philosophic situation to people. Imagine as a philosopher that there are people who can make arguments about why it's even possible to be skeptical about trees existing or that the sun exists. Those are things that are so intimately tied into our evolved history as human beings and yet now I can quickly call it into question and all I gotta do is say, how do you know you're not in the matrix? Or that all your life you've just been in an incredibly vivid dream like in Inception. Or you're in that vivid dream but you've just forgotten that you've entered the dream world. Media like The Matrix and Inception provides a quick communicative shortcut for philosophers. <laughs> and philosophers themselves sound less crazy when media paints a seemingly plausible scenario visually for the general public. The biggest problem though is that philosophers actually have made a lot of progress from there. But there isn't established media for us to use and refer to after that. Like I can't just be like Wittgenstein and expect people to understand that. They won't understand that I could maybe use a Wittgensteinian solution, sh sh solution? solution and point out in real life that this is just ungrounded doubt as he is pointed out in Uncertainty, his posthumous book, meaning it was published after he died. They therefore won't be even able to believe in a very practical setting I could, using this solution, help people who may be suffering from paranoid delusions. Or people who've been thoroughly brainwashed by waves and waves of nonsense internet conspiracy theories. Like if you delve into the conspiracy theory world long enough, normal people's thought process can sort of be reconfigured. Reconfigured to mimic somebody who's actually suffering from paranoid schizophrenia. And I'm not saying that conspiracies don't exist and secret government plans and such. They definitely do. But the extremity of the big rational construct created by those who have been down that conspiracy theory rabbit hole is so large and unfalsifiable that it can no longer be proven false by any amount of evidence. Well, popper. <coughs> Sorry, philosophy. That was me trying to do a philosophical shortcut again. See, you won't know what I'm talking about. Anyway, the general public doesn't really know that philosophers could actually help or that philosophers have actually moved on from simply just posing these questions. Instead, it would seem like to many that philosophers are just there to pose these edgy questions and just wonder about useless things with no progress. Much like the general public may think about the conspiracy theorists themselves. And that can happen, but before I complain too much about misunderstood philosophers, Inception. It more so than The Matrix deals with the issue of how do you know you're not in a dream, in another dream, within another dream? <clears throat> but with The Matrix, the issue is still there. How do you really know when you're out of The Matrix? 
The movie really didn't address it as much as Inception did, but you can bet your phaser rifle that people were still asking it. People still realized that no matter what you're shown, no matter how many times you're shown waking up out of the matrix, it could just be another program or part of the program to show you like you're waking up. You could just always be in the matrix, regardless of what's shown to you. So it's in these kind of fun philosophic situations that in one generation, my generation, we might be so inclined to be like, wow, man, how do you know you're not like in the matrix? And in another generation, more familiar with another media that points to the same exact philosophic problem, might be saying something along the lines, well, how do you know you're not like in inception? But it still points to the same philosophic issue. And more importantly, when people say you could be in a dream, within another dream, in another dream. Trekkies be like, what if all your dreams is in a holodeck, in another holodeck, in another holodeck? You know, nowadays kids are gonna be like, oh yeah, it's like Rick's and Smorty, Rick's and Smorty. What? No, it, no, it's not like Rick's and Smorty. Get out of here, you noobs. Oh, you want a Rick and Morty episode? Listen, I was actually about to make two and it had an awesome arc and I actually wrote a script for it and everything. Uh, this one was gonna be awesome. But I hadn't watched season 3 and I decided I should watch season 3 before I put out anything about Rick and Morty and season 3 totally ruined a lot of what I was going to say or pretty much said what I was going to say already. So that kind of threw a big wrench in my plans. I mean a lot of the content that I was going to put out about Rick and Morty is still pretty good so I think I should still do it. Anyway, I'm going to end this episode of my show with my favorite quote from Descartes. Written as he sat in a robe by the fire, drinking a glass of wine. Bitch, you crazy.